And uh, this patient is 58 year old uh, woman. Uh, she had a core biopsy of a breast mass in 2021, uh, very recent case. This is the outside diagnosis, invasive lobular carcinoma, triple negative, Icadirin stain is negative, supporting lobular phenotype. That's how it came from outside, believe me. I was surprised because uh, I do see a lot of invasive lobular carcinoma and uh, they rarely would look like this one. It's very spindled, in my opinion, uh, in some of these areas. It's very bloody. Again, it's a very bloody specimen. And I thought that, uh, you know, these stains, they had done triple negative carcinoma and Icadirin stain was negative, didn't prove anything at all. My mantra is that a negative stain doesn't prove anything. You need a positive stain to, to be sure about the diagnosis. And so the patient was transferred to her care at MSK. We reviewed the biopsy. We obtained the prior history. And uh, a few years earlier, she had, uh, in 2009, she had uh, an ipsilateral invasive triple negative ductal carcinoma. So at least uh, for that, we were sure it was not a lobular. She had a lumpectomy and had received radiotherapy and adjuvant chemo. And this was about 10 years before. So the thing to think about uh, was, uh, you know, a radiation induced angiosarcoma. And indeed, uh, we did ERG on the biopsy, all the keratins, uh, including also melanoma markers, SOX10. We did a panel of stains uh, just to demonstrate that it was negative for everything and positive for vascular markers. MIC was amplified, and our final diagnosis was radiation-induced angiosarcoma. She also had a mastectomy that proved uh, indeed uh, that this was uh, a vascular proliferation, a, an angiosarcoma with, uh, you know, all these abundant uh, red blood cells extravasated all over the place uh, and even in between uh, the spindle cell proliferation. This is the mastectomy in October. In February, just this year, she developed another uh, biopsy, a, an inguinal lymph node uh, became enlarged. She had a biopsy and she had metastatic uh, car, um, angiosarcoma to, to, the, to the groin area. And uh, look how epithelioid looks like this tumor. Maybe that's why they thought that uh, the original tumor, the original pathologist thought it could look like uh, lobular. But in reality, uh, I think it's always uh, good to use the immunostochemistry judiciously and uh, not try to fit the results of immunostochemistry to your diagnosis, interpret the results and not, uh, you know, interpret them so that they fit your diagnosis. So I wanted to give you, pit, you know, touch briefly on pitfalls in the diagnosis of angiosarcoma. On one side, uh, low-grade angiosarcomas, and on the other side, high grade, that it can be epithelioid. Low grade will be inconspicuous. So there are these dilated vessels with an irregular outline. And then you have to look for nuclear atypia, hyperchromasia, some upnailing of the nuclei. In the high grade spectrum, you have to think about the uh, differential diagnosis. Of, you know, it enters the differential diagnosis of high grade triple negative carcinoma. I always pay a lot of attention to this bloody background. And when I see blood in a case, uh, I always think in a core biopsy, I always think, could this be an angiosarcoma? And I try to rule that out just by looking around more carefully. If necessary, do keratins and uh, um, endothelial cell markers. And then the clinical history, as uh, Dr. Collins was mentioning, you know, is there, uh, maybe contact the clinician, ask, was there any skin discoloration or bruising or look in the medical records? Was there a prior radiation therapy? Just to give you an idea if this, the patient is, uh, um, could be predisposed. And uh, I already said it, the feature suggestive of a vascular lesion is this uh, bloody fragments, especially in a core biopsy and the hemorrhagic background that then prompt me to look more carefully and, uh, you know, identify the presence of these little 
vessels, very blinding, conspicuous, dissecting uh, um, along the collagen scaffold. And uh, here is uh, more of these irregular uh, dissecting vascular spaces. Once you see one and you start, uh, then you start to see a few more. The nuclei can be hyperchromatic and obnailing, although I don't see maybe some suggestion here. Uh, there is not a typical example in this slide. Um, this is another case. This patient is 48 year old uh, with, uh, uh, she was under high risk screening. So she had a core needle biopsy of an MRI known mass enhancement. Now, um, MRI is actually great to identify vascular lesions. So there is the possibility that the MRI non-mass enhancement could be due to a vascular lesion, in addition to many other things, as Dr. Collins mentioned. Uh, then uh, um, the, um, yeah, so she had the biopsy. And again, this was done elsewhere. It's not our case. Um, so I don't know if you uh, agree that already a low power, there are some uh, prominent uh, spaces that are seen here, very dilated here, here. They seem to be connecting. Uh, what do you think about this? Louder? No, anyone uh, would uh, be concerned about uh, vascular proliferation? <laughs> There is that possibility. And indeed, this was the original interpretation of the submitting pathologist who had stated that there were prominent vascular spaces, cannot rule out a vascular lesion. So we reviewed the case and we also thought that there were prominent vascular spaces. We thought they were benign. There is no evidence of, you know, an epithelial endothelial uh, cell hyperchromasia. They look like the dilated lymphatic vessels in many of these spaces, kind of excessively dilated the lymphatic channels, but uh, didn't seem to be dissecting uh, uh, or infiltrating into the lobules. So we were less suspicious, but you know, with that uh, suggestion from outside, the patient had an excision and I'm not showing you, but the excision was benign with a biopsy site. And uh, I want to mention this finding because the patient had an MRI biopsy that is done in prone position. And so it's, uh, there is a lot of uh, stasis that uh, is associated with being prone. And uh, that explains, at least in the majority of cases, these dilated lymphatics that you find in an MRI-guided corneal biopsy. And here is another case where uh, uh, that was an in-house case where the lesion was this fibroid adenomatoid little nodule, but you can see the dilated lymphatics at the periphery of this lesion. So not everything that uh, looks dilated and even suggestion of connection, interconnecting vessels, it's going to be a, um, an angiosarcoma, a logate angiosarcoma. You need the nuclear features also to go along with that. Uh, in some cases, uh, uh, this is more a hemangioma. Uh, SMA uh, is being used to highlight the pericytes around uh, these uh, dilated vascular spaces. If you find that, uh, I think uh, there is a word missing here, benign vascular uh, proliferation is probably uh, shifted below. In any case, uh, this, this stain, SMA positivity can be a useful staining to do in some cases. If you find the uh, positivity, it's not going to be a malignant lesion. This is another case, a 58 year old female. She received radiotherapy for breast carcinoma 10 years earlier. So it's a, the right period of time for her to develop an angiosarcoma, radiation-induced angiosarcoma. She had a slight skin discoloration. She had a skin punch biopsy. And uh, it's very hard uh, to see much of the lesion in this low power view, a little bit more visible here. There is increased cellularity, the spindling of the cells. Uh, 
and uh, it was stained with CD31 erg. Uh, um, it was clearly a vascular proliferation, very superficial in a patient who had prior radiation therapy. Um, it has a somewhat infiltrative look, but uh, it was very small, as I showed you before, right? Very circumscribed. So um, we did also mix staining, it didn't stain for mix. So our interpretation was uh, um, a typical vascular lesion, mic negative, so unlikely to be an angiosarcoma. We didn't say that, but uh, it's an atypical vascular lesion and classified as such, keep following. Now, in comparison, atypical vascular lesion, just a few words, they tend to be small and circumscribed. They have this symmetrical wedge shape uh, appearance, uh, typically superficial, limited to the superficial or uh, mid dermis, uh, do not extend into the subcutaneous tissue, typically. And um, in contrast, an angiosarcoma radiation induced is poorly circumscribed, infiltrative, extends into subcutaneous tissue and breast parenchyma. So very different. Um, now, mic amplification, we know, is a diagnostic feature of angiosarcomas and uh, is uh, uh, especially radiation induced angiosarcomas and can be detected by fish. It is also detected in primary angiosarcomas, but the levels of amplifications are usually lower than in radiation induced. And so it, usually it's not used as a diagnostic tool in primary angiosarcoma. In general, no mic amplification has been reported in AVL, in a, a typical vascular lesion. Now, immunohistochemistry for mic uh, can be positive in some cases and uh, of angiosarcoma, radiation-induced angiosarcoma, it can be useful to support the diagnosis. But actually there is no study that has uh, really proven that is definitive. So if you have uh, a mic positive uh, lesion, you will uh, are likely to have, uh, in a, to be dealing with an angiosarcoma. Although I must say I've had recently a case was faintly positive. It was not an angiosarcoma. So immunohistochemistry has limitations. But what if it is negative? Does that prove anything? As I told you before, a negative stain does not exclude anything. In this particular lesion, we couldn't demonstrate it was not an angiosarcoma, but it should be watched. And actually she came back six months later at this point, uh, it, the tumor had declared itself and uh, the patient underwent a left breast decision and there is plenty of angiosarcoma that grew very rapidly. And uh, there are mitoses, there are these, uh, uh, you know, spaces, uh, clefted spaces that are quite characteristic uh, at the periphery of the lesion, other areas are much more solid. We did ERG, clearly this was an angiosarcoma. We still uh, did uh, mix staining and even fish was negative. There was uh, no mic amplification in this case. No positivity by uh, immunohistochemistry and nothing, uh, no amplification by uh, fish. In the previous, in the punch biopsy, the lesion was basically depleted and we couldn't do fish. So I didn't have that information for uh, the punch biopsy. So do angiosar do all radiation induced angiosarcomas uh, uh, have uh, mic amplification? Well, uh, um, my colleague, Dr. Kuba did a study looking at 81 radiation induced angiosarcomas diagnosed at our institution. And out of 81, the majority, 90%, were mic amplified, but there were eight cases, 10% of the total, that were not mic amplified. And uh, so they, if you just rely on mic, they would not have been identified, you know, diagnosed. The patient age, they tended to be slightly younger, but no substantial difference in the two groups. The latency time to develop the lesion was similar, 7.5 years in both groups. In this study, she also looked at the follow-up and confirmed that angiosarcoma is a poor prognosis, a very abysmal prognosis, even um, 
with modern treatment and only 50% uh, rate of uh, uh, five year uh, disease specific survival at five years and only basically one uh, out of two patients was still alive after five years. So the worst prognosis in this study were associated with older age of the patients, a larger tumor size, positive margins, and with mic amplification. So having mic amplification seems to be associated with a more aggressive behavior, but, uh, you know, mic is not always amplified, even in radiation-induced angiosarcomas, or, or at least the gene itself. There may be downstream activation of the pathway, but uh, mic amplification is not detected. So I don't know how many of you use uh, mic immuno or um, uh, mic fish uh, for your diagnosis, but beware that there are some cases of angiosarcoma that are not mic amplified. So in terms of take home messages for this vascular lesion, keep in mind bloody background, rule out a vascular lesion, look for these dissecting interconnecting vascular spaces, Look if there is endothelial, nuclear TP, hypertomasia, obnailing. Remember, no mic amplification in some uh, radiation-induced angiosarcoma. So if you have uh, an ADL, an atypical vascular lesion that you diagnose as such as mic negative uh, by fish, by immunostain, that does, you know, the patient needs to be followed closely. And any change in her clinical, you know, pr presentation needs to be monitored and repeat biopsy. And then on the other end of the spectrum, do not overdiagnose atypical vascular proliferations. Uh, there are situations where you can just be dealing with the dilated vascular spaces, which are very common in MRI guided for needle biopsy. In these cases, there is no hemorrhage, no nuclear atypia, should not be overinterpreted, and the SMA positivity in pericytes can be helpful. Uh, clinical history, Dr. Collins said earlier, is a great tool, is the best immuno you can do, uh, and the cheapest as well, get the prior material, compare. Uh, in the case, uh, and uh, um, in terms of uh, the morphologic findings of the case uh, should guide your interpretation and not try to, you know, obtain uh, to adapt the results of immunohistochemical stain to your preconceived diagnosis, like in the case of the ICADIRIN negative uh, invasive lobular carcinoma. So I think I will go on. If there are no questions, this is a, a brief review of uh, interesting cases. I have other cases I can present, but if there are no other questions about, uh, no questions about this. Oh, wait. Sorry. That's very, very clear. And I think the tech will need to, uh, to come back though. I have, um, let's see, other interesting cases. Um, uh, I may show these other, uh, sorry. Oh, I don't know. There are many cases uh, that are interesting to me. Uh, <laughs> uh, here is, uh, let's uh, look at this one. Okay. Yeah. So I hope I'm starting at the right spot, but uh, here is another interesting uh, case. Um, the, uh, it's about adenoid cystic carcinoma, or at least a differential diagnosis of adenoid cystic. It can occur in salivary glands, breast, skin, can occur at any age, also in men. Morphology, the conventional morphology is on top. The uh, solid basaloid type uh, is at the bottom, not an image is at the bottom. Notice uh, that it has uh, always this very delicate mixoid quality of the stroma, very bluish, light blue that actually sometimes it can even mimic uh, mucin, uh, paradoxically. And I've seen cases where it was uh, interpreted as a mucinous carcinoma, but that's another story. In terms of immunohistochemistry, usually it's positive for MIB, CD117 and SOX10. The conventional type has beautiful positivity for T63 in the myoepithelial component. 
The solid basal oid uh, type uh, usually is P63 negative, usually triple negative. And there is a characteristic molecular alteration that uh, is a gene fusion, MIB and FIB, or MIB with other partners, or MIB-like MIB -like one with NFIB. So there are different uh, partners. We just uh, could, you know, completed this, published a study looking at the very uh, alterations in solid and basaloid adenoid cystic. It has uh, many notch mutations that associate with the worst prognosis. But MIB stains both the conventional type and also the solid and basaloid type, even though the solid basaloid, not always, actually very rarely has MIB and PFIB fusion. This is not advancing. Okay. So adenoid cystic carcinoma is also positive for SOX10 and GATA3. And uh, this uh, case is part of a discussion of uh, differential diagnosis between skin and breast uh, tumors. Many times there is some overlap between the two and given the proximity, one never knows, is this a skin tumor, is this a breast tumor? Well, GATA3 doesn't help in such cases because it's positive in 20% of skin adenoid cystic carcinoma, in one out of two salivary gland adenoid cystic. In the breast, there is no published data. I stained a few cases. Some cases were GATA3 negative, some cases GATA3 weakly positive. Um, and I did all this uh, because, uh, you know, I had a case uh, where I thought I had uh, a primary skin adenoid cystic carcinoma of, uh, of uh, a cutaneous uh, adenoid cystic carcinoma. But uh, it turned out uh, because I had a, you know, biopsy of a chest wall lesion uh, that, however, turned out to be a metastasis an involvement, a nodule in the dermis, in the subcutaneous tissue, um, basically due to recurrence of a, a adenoid cystic carcinoma of the breast that the patient had previously. So in this case, again, the clinical, you know, history was essential to the diagnosis. No immunostains would have helped. Now, adenoid cystic carcinoma often mimics or looks very similar to cylindroma. That is a benign skin neoplasm, usually circumscribed, usually superficial it's in the dermis, may extend into the subcutis. It's also biphasic, just like adenoid cystic, epithelio, epithelio and myepithelio, as this beautiful cuticle of basement membrane all around, very uh, thick and uh, highly looking, and the uh, pieces, you know, the nest uh, fit together with the pieces, like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. Similar immunostochemistry to adenoid cystic, SOX10, calponin, P63, P40, CD117, and MIB. MIB can also be positive in adenoid, in uh, cylindroma. However, the tumor has no MIB alteration. Some cases have another alteration in CYLD, whether they are part of a syndrome or they are sporadic cases. <coughs> this is the case I want to present. Uh, so 61 year old woman has a 10 millimeter mass near the nipple. There it is, a core biopsy, you know. Uh, the outside diagnosis was a biphasic basaloid neoplasm, favor adenoid cystic carcinoma. I already put our diagnosis, uh, was pretty much the same uh, the diagnosis, but we favored the cylindroma. Why is that? Uh, you know, was our diagnosis right? Well, to me, this looks like a cylindroma. It has, uh, you know, the jigsaw puzzle uh, look, uh, the thick collagen, sorry, the thick basement membrane all around. There is no nuclear atypia. Um, and the CD117 is positive. P63 is positive, MIB is also positive, but weakly positive in uh, uh, a very spotty positivity uh, with uh, heterogeneous intensity. So that's not enough uh, to render a diagnosis of adenoid cystic uh, in this case. So we favor the cylindroma. Who was right? Well, the excision will tell. And uh, here is the excision. The excision was wedged. Uh, the tumor is wedged between benign breast parenchyma here and here, and it's discreetly nodular except for this spot. 
where it seems to extend into the fat, right? So it has an infiltrative pattern, at least focally. A cylindroma should be circumscribed. What do you think this is? Excuse me? Actually, it's a very good thought, but there is no evidence of a biopsy tract uh, or a biopsy site, uh, like Dr. Collins, we should find some reactive stroma. The fact uh, here looks pretty intact, uh, except for this, uh, uh, this, um, this proliferation. So our interpretation was cylindroma. Now, you may say you're wrong, but uh, uh, I don't have a definitive diagnosis in this case. Uh, we tried to do mutational analysis and the, the tumor didn't have any characteristic alteration. Uh, RNA sequencing found uh, no fusion gene, no MIB-related alteration. There was nothing related to CYD. So our diagnosis was cylindroma with focal peripheral infiltration. Uh, you have to take my word for that. Can cylindroma occur in the breast? Indeed, it can. Here is a list of a review of 17 cases put together by Dr. Raka. And notice how big they were, ranging in size from 7 to even 20 millimeters, 2 centimeters size in the breast. And many were detected as palpable masses some screen detected. And uh, so it was not, they were not necessarily all incidental finding. And here is a case from Dr. Fusco, who, when he was at Memorial, did a study looking at um, adenoid cystic carcinoma. And there was a case that they came across, uh, it was initially called adenoid cystic, was re-reviewed for part for the study, and, uh, you know, low nuclear grade, the thick basement membrane, the jigsaw puzzle pattern were noticed. MIB was focally positive. There was a no fusion, MIB and 5D fusion, and they reclassified this tumor as a cylindroma. There was actually, I think here, a clonal somatic CYLD mutation. This was definitively a cylindroma even though it was very deep in the breast. So keep in mind uh, uh, this type of lesion, this benign skin tumor can occur very deep in the breast. And uh, I have another case in the last three minutes. This was, um, a, this was a 70 year old woman with the right axillary mass. It's right here. It looks like a lymph node, probably involved by a carcinoma. What do you think about this carcinoma? It looks ugly, number one. It has a lot of these, uh, you know, delicate uh, mixoid, uh, you know, is, is this mucin? It doesn't look like mucin to me. It looks more like matrix. But we consider the possibility of an unusual mucin-producing carcinoma. It has a, a kind of a trabecular growth. Uh, we thought about adenoid cystic of the skin because it has this basaloid look uh, and or adenoid cystic of the breast or uh, some kind of another breast, you know, occult carcinoma we didn't know about. So uh, there was no lymph node tissue, no breast tissue in this biopsy. So we got the excision. This is the excision clearly involving uh, a lymph node with all this fibrous capsule all around. The tumor has the same morphology, very basaloid, scatter three positive, negative for all these markers, including MIB, CD117. We did all kinds of stains in this case, no neuroendocrine markers. What do you think it could be? Urotelial is a suggestion. Urotelial carcinoma can be GATA3 positive, but uh, I cannot think of a urotelial carcinoma that would have this morphology metastasized to a lymph node with all these uh, sclerosis all around it uh, in the setting of, uh, you know, not diffuse metastatic disease. So, well, clinical history. We obtained clinical history, and actually first we did uh, P63 and P40 very positive throughout. Breast carcinomas that are this positive for P63 and P40, squamous cell carcinoma, 
this is an artist for myself, carcinoma. Then uh, there is practically, I would say, no other breast cancer that could have this diffuse, strong, uh, homogeneous positivity for P63 and P40. These points uh, to a skin tumor. When I see this level of positivity for P63 throughout the lesion, it's a skin tumor, more likely than not. Of course, you have to prove it. And then we obtain clinical history. And it turns out that the patient had a prior history of multiple basal cell carcinomas of the face and the back, also ipsilateral. And uh, at least one of them was a nodular basal cell carcinoma. And uh, this was a metastasis from that tumor. I mean, without a clinical history, it would have been very difficult to uh, point in that direction. The only clue was P63 and P40 diffuse positivity. Um, I don't know. I think I can stop here. 